Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Rossi Pavilion at the renovated and reborn National Arts Centre, one of the most beautiful rooms and one of the most beautiful buildings in the country. It's a natural setting for what we're going to try and do here tonight. You know, Ottawa does a lot of things well. Ottawa does accusation well. It does allegation well. It does recrimination. It does suspicion. Sometimes Ottawa forgets to pause for a conversation. And the National Arts Centre and we at McLean's have been trying for years to create a space here where we can just have some conversations, where we can just talk about stuff. And tonight, thanks to our sponsors at the Canadian Bankers Association, we're beginning a long-term experiment in Canadian conversations. And partly because of the moment in our national political life, partly because our, my guest tonight has been a little bit hard to uh, track down and get him to stop moving from city to city to city since he became the NDP leader, I thought that he'd be a natural to start this series of Canadian conversations. I hope you'll give it up for our first guest, Jagmeet Singh. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. We're catching you at a quiet moment in a busy time because in 10 days uh, you're going to be uh, gathering with your colleagues from across the country for your first NDP convention as, as the party's leader. That's right. And two days no ago... No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's nothing compared to the other thing because two days ago you began the process of getting married. That's right. Tell us about that. Uh, it, was a, it was amazing. It was a, a gathering at a, at a local place of meditation in the mm -hmm. Sikh tradition called the Gurdwara. And I got to meet uh, with my partner and a whole bunch of friends and family and supporters, and we all got to get together and have a beautiful, beautiful evening together. How do you coordinate the, the process of getting married with the process of putting your stamp on a national institution like the NDP? With an incredible partner. I think I have to give her so much credit. She's super patient with me mm -hmm. and has been like a rock of support. So I have to give her lots of credit. And I have an incredible team around me. I mean, a leader is only as good as, as the team that you have around you. And I have an incredible team of MPs, of staff, uh, and that's made everything possible. OK. I want to start by trying to figure out how you got involved in this crazy life sure. of politics. Uh, for the last several years, I've had every, every election, I learned that I've got friends who are presenting themselves as candidates for one party or another. And my immediate reaction is always concern uh, <laughs> on their behalf. And I think, no, not you. Um, <laughs> And I have to, I always wonder for them, and, and, and so it's natural that I would wonder for you, how did you get involved in politics? Why does this strange life appeal to you? I ask myself that question a lot. <laughs> Why did I do this? No, it was, um, I, there was a series of events. It's hard to pinpoint one specific event. I would say like a part of it was my mom really drilling this idea that we're all connected, helped develop that seed of my social justice kind of sensibilities. Uh, that was a big part of it. Uh, when I was in university, I was involved in different movements, trying to help out wherever I could. Having faced a bit of unfairness in my life made me sensitive to unfairness in the people around me. So I really cared about making things better. And then as a law student, I continued to be involved in different groups, working on anti-poverty projects and helping those most vulnerable. That was a big issue for me, how we can help people that have the least power in society. So immigrant, refugee work, um, also just human rights in general. And then the groups that I work with, some of them my friends and my colleagues, uh, really started to feel that there wasn't a partnership that they could rely on at the political level. And they started encouraging me to consider getting into politics. And I thought, you know, that's not for me. I'd seen working on the outside, pushing politicians to get work done, I thought was a better fit for me. And I didn't like, like, the over-partisan battles, which sounds weird as now the leader of a political party, I'm sure it sounds. But, but I didn't, I thought that there was a lot of, fighting for no reason and fighting kind of in, in a way that didn't seem to be advancing something meaningful. And it took some time for me to get to be convinced. And I started to see, the, I think the one thing that really spoke to me was, as a lawyer, I helped one client at a time and helped one individual at a time. And I liked the work that I was doing in the community where I was helping more people. And I think that was really what spoke to me, that the position of leadership that being in politics gives you is an opportunity to help many people. And that's something that I felt you know, if we're going to do this, let's do this in a meaningful way. 
And then the party for me was an easy choice. I'd always voted New Democrat, even though I hadn't volunteered or been involved. But all the things that I cared about, helping people out, helping those less fortunate. Um, my dad always said, you know, why are, why are we making laws to help those who are already doing well in society? We should, we should help people that need help. And that really spoke to me. So uh, the New Democratic Party was an easy fit, you know, for justice, for social, uh, for social justice, for human rights, and to just lift people up and help people who needed that help. Okay. I was surprised when I... Uh, read your life story because I, I associate you with the GTA and with the Brampton area. First time I heard about you was during the, well, the first time I kind of retained the name was during the 2015 election when people said it's Navdeep Baines versus uh, Jamit Singh in, 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 the, in the Brampton area. Um, but you grew up partly in Newfoundland, in St. John's. That's right. Partly in Windsor, Ontario, not right. far for, from where I grew up in Sarnia. Oh, cool, yeah. Um, not an awful lot of Sikh families in those in, in those neighborhoods. No, and not sometimes, at all. apparently, in, especially in Windsor, it was a little rough. Yeah, I mean, I had I, I would say at the same time, I had a great childhood. I had lots of great memories. Uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, Labrador, for me, is a very special place. Like some of my formative years as a, as a child is where I where I grew up. And two of the things that I I think every city, every place that I that I was able to live had left a, has left a mark on me in some way. So when I do two of my favorite act, favorite activities, I love cycling, riding bikes. People kind of know me for that. It's a thing that I do. Uh, I learned how to ride a bike in St. John's. So every time I get on a bike, I'm kind of reminded of my Atlanta, Canada roots. And, and swimming is a big part of my life. I love, love to swim. And I learned how to swim in a park right across from where I grew up in mm -hmm. St. John's, in Bowering Park. So that's part of that. And, uh, and growing up in Windsor, I mean, I had great experiences, great teachers and friends. And you know, I was in, involved in soccer. I had great coaches. Uh, but at the same time, I, I definitely faced uh, you know, some discrimination based on the way I looked. I faced... Uh, that feeling of not belonging because of my identity, you know, the color of my skin, and, and those are tough times. There's bullying, there's fights, and things like that. And your father at one point sent you to a private school in Detroit. That's right. Um, almost the first time that anyone ever sent someone to Detroit because it was less of a rough neighborhood. Right. <laughs> That's a good one. In fairness, he was a little bit outside of, like, the, the core of Detroit. It was kind of in a suburb, okay. even though the name says Detroit. Okay. And the... But the decision to get into politics was driven by a specific cause, I believe, uh, the, the, the sense of uh, a historic injustice that was done to the Sikh community. Am I right there? Or? Well, it was a part of, of the work that I was doing on human rights, international human rights, was around issues impacting the Sikh community for sure. But the groups that I worked with were also involved in anti-poverty movements. Uh, there was a group that was doing a lot of work on immigrant and refugee rights. So there was a number of, of folks that were, I guess, activists that I was working with and, and supporting in different endeavors. And it was kind of a, like a coalition of people that I was working with that all really encouraged me to, to consider this path. Okay. Michael Kelly, the great American um, political journalist who died in the Iraq War, uh, used to write for The New Yorker. And he used to say that politics is the art of seeming natural while you do things that no adult... Uh, uh, would, would willfully do. Uh, <laughs> did you have to train yourself to uh, cheerfully speak to strangers, to remember their names, to uh, shake their hands, to stand at the right angle if there was a camera? Is that all? Or, or, or are you a natural at that? Well, I don't like to say I'm a natural at anything. I think yeah. that everything in life people have worked at, even if they don't know it, maybe consciously, you've kind of worked at things in a, in a subtle way. And so I would say this is something I thought of. But if mm -hmm. I look back, I mentioned that I'd face some bullying and discrimination. I, I enjoyed, I ended up enjoying martial arts as, a, as, a, as an art form and as the discipline, but I didn't like that I was getting in fights. I didn't enjoy that. I actually wanted to find ways to connect with people, and I wanted to find ways to disarm people. And I didn't think of this as like a strategy when I was growing up, but I noticed that I would try to find ways to find that commonality. I guess drawing back from my mom's teaching that we're connected. And I think subtly throughout my life, I was always finding ways to connect with people. And, and connecting is what ideally a, a good leader should be able to connect with people. And I feel like my life, all, all the moments in my life kind of helped me hone this skill of finding that way to, to find the commonality, even if I look like a very unique kind of identity, someone that you wouldn't think that there's a commonality. I, I tried to find that, that thread of shared kind of connection. Okay. In that 2011 election uh, where you ran federally, you came real close to winning, but you yeah. didn't quite win. You, the, the orange wave didn't quite reach that far <laughs> west. Uh, and then almost immediately you run provincially and you became the first New Democrat elected in your riding. That's right. Um, were you, uh, did you think it'd be harder? <laughs> I mean, no one's, New Democrats weren't supposed to win in your neck of the woods. Absolutely, I mean, and you, you wouldn't run New Democrat to win in the, in the Peel region entirely. In fact, when we won, it wasn't the first time just in the riding, it was the first time that a New Democrat won 
at any level, municipal to federal, uh, in any of the ridings in the entire Peel region, which is about you know, over 1.3 million people. So it was a pretty massive breakthrough. But when we decided as a team, when I was convinced to get into politics, I said, listen, we're going to do something different. Let's do it differently. If we're going to do this, let's do it in a way that's consistent with our values and our principles. And, and the party I chose had to be a party that, that made sense for me that in terms of my values. And it wasn't something about what would be the easiest path to win. It was about what is the most consistent with our values. And it was an easy choice. And so it, it wasn't a choice that made the most sense to win, if I'm honest. But it was a choice that made the most sense in terms of what I believed in. OK. Skip forward a few years to uh, your decision to run for the NDP leadership and your victory. Um, now, that part has been fairly exhaustively covered, so we won't go over that <laughs> bit by bit. Sure. But I'm wondering about the, the situation of the NDP party today, the mm -hmm. NDP today. Mm -hmm. um, this guy named uh, Tom Mulcair. Right. Maybe you've heard of him. I have. Uh, he won. We chatted time, from time to time. <laughs> he, I bet. He won 44 seats in 2015. That's the second best result that uh, any New Democratic Party leader ever got in the history of the party. Mm -hmm. Tom Mulcair in uh, 2015 got more seats than Ed Broadbent ever did, more seats right. than Tommy Douglas ever did. He got more seats than uh, Jack Layton did in 2004 or 2006 or 2008. And his thanks was that the party evicted him as leader six months later. What kind of bar does that set for you? Uh, it's tough. I mean, politics is a, t is a tough world. And, and I, I have to acknowledge that any leader has to do so much. There's so much sacrifice. So I've, I thank Tom lots of times for his work and, and his leadership and for, for doing what he's done for the party. And it's, it's a big sacrifice. Um, what I look at the bar that I'm setting for myself, what I want to do is really advance the issues that I hear about. How can, can we as a party work towards making sure people across this country, their voices are heard. So when I hear the stories of, of seniors talking to me about the fact that they're literally cutting their pills in half because they can't afford a prescription, I want that story to be front and center. When I meet with young professionals that are graduating with professional degrees and can't afford to rent a place, let alone buy a place, I mean, I want their stories to be heard. That's the bar I set. How much positive can I do as leader in terms of bringing these stories to Ottawa across this country and making sure we bring change in their lives. Sometimes I think that that amazing NDP result in 2011 was a, almost a curse for the party. Because before that, for, for, for 50 years, the NDP did as well as it could and, 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 it, and it brought what it could to the table and a liberal government would occasionally take some of its ideas and everything was fine. And then in, in 2011, they, came, they stopped just at, almost at the, at the, at the doorstep of power, and um, people forget that it took Jack Layton four campaigns to get that far. Uh, and the assumption now is uh, it's make or break for the NDP. You've got it, you, you're, you're in this to win it, and that means if you don't, there's, it, it's perceived at a level of failure that it might not have been once upon a time. Well, I think that Jack Layton definitely you know, elevated the bar. There's no doubt about it. But I think what he did more than the electoral result, is what he did to connect everyday people. Mm -hmm. People, if you meet, like talk to people, and they, the way they talk about Jack is like, that was someone that was out there fighting for me, he had my back, he was someone that took the stories that people told him and brought those to, to, to the spotlight and gave that the attention to deserve. That's, I think, what, what we need to hold as a standard, that how can we continue that same vision? And when it comes to electoral success or not, it's, it's about how can we put forward an agenda and a set of values and ideas that people can be inspired by to say, this is going to make my life better. This is going to make sure that I have the access to medication when I need it. This is going to make sure that I can, I can see barriers torn down to, to getting education, because we know education is so important. This is going to you know, help um, put forward an agenda that's going to make uh, an, an economy that works for everybody, as opposed to an economy that's working just for the few. These are some of the things that I think if we focus on, uh, that's the vision that Jack Layton kind of that's a bar he set, was really telling those stories and making people feel connected to him as a leader, but really seeing themselves reflected in the work he was doing. Okay. Um, every time you're in Ottawa and you meet a journalist like me, we ask, are you going to run for parliament? <laughs> because we assume that that place over there is where all the action is. Let's just, let's just um, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that you're not going to run for parliament this week. You've been out in the country and you've been seeing a lot of stuff that I haven't been seeing. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing across the country that can inform the work that you eventually want to do here? Uh, it's interesting. People, people feel 
okay about the government, in fairness, but they do feel stuck in their lives. You know, if you ask them the question, are you better off now than you were five years ago? And they'll say, no, I feel like I'm stuck where I am. Mm -hmm. that, that I, can't, I work as hard as I can, but I can't seem to get ahead. I can't seem to, to make life a bit more comfortable for myself. And then young people are looking at the future and, and are a bit worried. There's a sense of worry about the future and a bit of uncertain, uncertainty. And, and I think that's troubling to me. I feel like young people should have a, a future that's bright and optimistic and they should feel like they can achieve anything they want. And I think there's, there's barriers to that, you know, education in terms of tuition fees then the debt that's uh, on top of students. I think it's a big crushing feeling. Uh, housing is something that comes up. And I, I thought it was something to localize to you know, maybe big urban centers. But when I started hearing it in the Atlantic provinces in Halifax and St. John's and hearing it in Victoria, and then hearing it in smaller communities outside of Victoria, I started to think that this is not, this is a truly national crisis. And if something is a national crisis, the government's acknowledged that, but then they're saying, we're not gonna do anything until two years. To me, if something's a crisis, you have to act now. People can't afford to wait. And I think that's, that's the sense I'm getting. That there's an urgency to see some real action and, and something that's gonna make people feel like they're not stuck where they are, that they're actually seeing a, a potential to improve their lives. Okay, and yet unemployment is at its lowest level in 40 years and uh, growth in Canada was the highest in the G7 last year. Uh, these don't sound like crisis statistics. Absolutely, and that's the thing. I, when I speak to people about that, you know, the economy looks like it's doing well, the employment numbers look like they're, they're really low. People say, well, the numbers are showing that, and they don't contest the numbers. They're saying, though, that's not how it feels in my life, though. My life doesn't feel like it's any better, even if the numbers are showing this massive growth. I don't feel like I'm able to get by. And I know a lot of people can find work, but what type of work are they finding? We're at the first time ever in the history of our country where the core working age, uh, half of that group is now in precarious or unstable work. So there is work out there, but it's no longer that quality good work. And, and people are, are seeing these, these figures that show this great economic boom, but in their own lives, they're not feeling that things are better. And they're not feeling that the economy might be working, but it's not working for them. It's not working for everyday people. And that, to me, is a, is a big problem. Okay, what's the missing ingredient to, 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 to bring these benefits closer to people? Uh, it's inequality. Right now we're seeing, uh, last year, um, Oxfam put out a report that of the wealth generated, 82% of the wealth generated in the last year went to the top 1% of, of the most wealthy. That's exactly the problem. Wealth is being generated, but it's being concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. That's really the issue. We need to make sure that we develop an, an inclusive economy that works for everybody, that everyone sees the benefit of an economy that's working for them as well. So we need to tackle inequality, and I propose uh, a couple of pieces of how we can move towards that. Okay. How much of the convention in a little bit more than a week's time is going to be uh, devoted to rolling out the elements of uh, an NDP election platform, or is it way too early for that? Uh, well, I mean, strategically, maybe you might say it's a bit early, but I think it's important to start putting out our values. And, and the convention is going to be about that. What are our values? What do we believe in? And so you'll see some really, I don't want to give it away, you know, some of the exciting things we're going to do. But really, it's, it's about putting people front and center, uh, hearing the, the, the stories that people have to share, and, and making sure that we have policies that address those, those issues, those struggles, those concerns that people have. Okay. Is the NDP still at all preoccupied with balancing the budget? I mean, that was, the, that was a, a, a huge debate when Tom Mulcair was the leader, but not only when Tom Mulcair was the leader. Jack Layton promised to balance the budget uh, five years earlier. Um, is, is that now that the Liberals have blown the lid off of that, are you, is that no longer something you have to worry about? Yeah, I think it's maybe no longer a, a big issue. People haven't been talking about it a lot, but I think it's important to put my values out there on the table. Uh, I'm opposed to austerity in, in all its forms. Austerity is not the way forward. So if we're not doing well and we're in difficult economic times, I believe in, in deficit funding to ensure that we continue with our social programs that we need. I believe strongly in universal social programs. Uh, we need programs that lift people up that everyone can access. And uh, if we need to deficit fund that when times are tough, I, I believe in that. The question for me is about how do we put the, the priorities and the concerns of people in the front and, and keep that foremost in our minds. The times we're living through now meet your definition of tough times? Uh, I mean, I would have to look at, at the finances of the government to, to figure out, you know, can we invest more in, in social programs? Um, the economic numbers are showing that it's not tough times per se, but the realities that people are facing kind of don't really match up. So with that growing inequality, you'd have to look at the, the details of the finances and figure out, can we invest more in social programs? I want to, I believe we need to, 
I believe we can't afford not to. Okay. So reducing inequality includes programs for people who are uh, struggling and are less well off. Uh, I think it often also means, if I can paraphrase Tommy Douglas, sticking it to the fat cats. Is that part <laughs> of your plan too? Well, I mean, I wouldn't use uh, our, our esteemed uh, leader, ancient leader's uh, <laughs> words, but absolutely. I mean, look, we have the, the Paradise Papers, the Panama Papers, that show that there's massive wealth that's being siphoned out of our country, uh, wealth that could be invested into universal social programs, that could be invested in things like pharmacare or free tuition, uh, or expanding our health care to include dental care or eye care. So we could invest in these programs, but we're not able to because we're missing out on that, on that wealth. So I propose two solutions. One is ending CEO stock options and changing and increasing the inclusion rate on capital gains so that you know, the ultra wealthy, uh, we would see an increase on the capital gains so that you know, we can capture more of that wealth. But we need to do a lot more. There's, there's massive wealth that is not being invested in Canada that needs to be. Okay. Um, I've seen estimates that uh, with the stock option loophole thing that you're talking about, you could go and get like a billion dollars a year from a very small number of, of uh, Canadians in the end, a few hundred, a few thousand. What's to keep them from leaving or from, or from moving their business out of the country? Well, I think there's a, there's a certain climate here in Canada that, that's maybe not the weather climate, but <laughs> thanks. But there's a certain <laughs> climate here that, that's, that's important, that people that come to Canada, we have a stable government, uh, we have uh, a great universal health care program. Uh, we have a highly educated workforce. There's certain advantages that we were going to have. Uh, and that measure of fairness is to the CEO. It doesn't impact the overall uh, the structure of a, of a company, of its ability to, to produce a product, to be successful. It's a matter of fairness, and I think it's something that people want to see happen, and I'm, I believe it needs to happen. Okay. Um, the Liberals promised that they would you know, reduce access to these uh, CEO stock options in their platform in 2015, and then in their first budget, uh, a lot of tech groups and entrepreneurial uh, firms, like Shopify, just up the street here, screamed blue murder and said, this is the way we encourage people to give the, the, the most productive years of their life to the company, is the promise that they can cash in stock options down the road. Are you going to uh, damage the tech industry if you, if you uh, go after these stock options? Well, we've made our proposal, our starting proposal, very clear. It's specific to CEOs and, and those stock options. Um, I'm very aware of the, the future that we need to build in terms of the economy when it comes to entrepreneurs, startups, uh, people in the innovative, innovative sectors and the tech sectors, and making sure that we have built a climate that allows for that innovation, that supports that innovation, and that encourages it. So that's something that I'm very cognizant of. I have a, I have a circle of folks that I, that I reach out to and talk to a lot that give me advice on that. And so that's something that we want to make sure that our plan is to ensure that those who are, who are wealthy, that the ultra-rich, those who have the resources, are investing that back into Canada, to Canadians, to their lives. That's important. But we don't want in any way to, to discourage innovation and discourage the ability for people to come together and innovate and have a, a company flourish. Okay. You have uh, been asked a lot recently, given all the uh, headlines in the news, about free trade. And often you say... Uh, that you prefer fair trade over free trade. I want to nail you down on the specifics, specifics of what that means. Sure. Is NAFTA now, is CETA now, and is the CPTPP, the new kid on the block, are those fair trade deals? Well, I have to break them each, one, each of them down. Uh, there is, there's components of NAFTA, for example, that are not, they don't meet the definition of, of fair trade. Uh, two of the, three of the key areas, I would say. One is, if we want to strike a trade agreement, first of all, we're a trading nation. We need to have trade. We rely on it. A vast proportion of our, of our jobs in our country rely on, on trade agreements. So we need them. But a fair trade agreement, a fair agreement, would, would look at labor and environmental uh, regulations. So if we have an agreement with a country like Mexico that doesn't support or protect the rights of workers, that doesn't have the same environmental regulations, how can Canadians ever compete with that jurisdiction? We need to make sure that we're in, on a level playing field for competition, but also we have certain values. We want to protect the environment. We want to respect human rights, the rights of workers. So it's a values piece, but it's also a fairness piece so that we can actually have a fair uh, level playing field. So on that area, we're, we're seeing a lack in NAFTA. The other piece of fairness that's really missing in NAFTA is Chapter 11, where um, there is a clause that allows corporations to effectively sue the country, to sue nations. Um, and, and we see that one example of it, which is really pernicious, is the water delivery, the municipal system. In Canada, we have public ownership of water. There was a lawsuit to challenge that public ownership and public delivery to say private companies felt it was a monopoly, that they wanted to be able to sell water 
privately. And we fought back that, that, uh, that challenge, but that's, that's the fear of an agreement like NAFTA, that companies are allowed to make a challenge to something as precious as our access of our water. That, to me, is not fair. But those clauses exist to protect Canadian investors, too, so that when I set up shop in Mexico or eventually one day in China or, uh, or, or in Slovakia, that I won't be treated uh, differently than the, the local companies. Isn't that fair? The idea that Slovak government or the Polish government or the uh, Mexican government can, by fiat, say the Canadian's not allowed to play here. Isn't that unfair? Well, we have to look at in what area. If that's clothing, if it's, you know, um, in producing a, a particular product, uh, that's not something that's tied to our, our ability to, to live. There should be a clear distinction between the government's ability to regulate uh, public ownership of things like our water, our electricity, uh, our ability to regulate healthcare issues. Yeah. There was one of the one of the the big cases that that was uh, that Chapter 11 was used was when our government said, "Hey, listen, there's a, a carcinogenic that's being used in fuel. We don't want to allow that." And they said it's going to be banned. Lawsuit was brought against Canada to say, "No, that's going to negatively impact our company," and Canada had to roll back a regulation that was to protect the health of the people of our country. That, to me, is not the spirit of the idea behind protecting investors and protecting companies. It should not impede on the sovereignty of our country to make decisions in the benefit of the people of the country, whether it's their health, whether it's for public ownership of a, of a particular service like water or electricity. That's where it shouldn't be contravening or, or undermining the authority of a country. Is no NAFTA better than NAFTA? Uh, well, we rely on NAFTA in a lot of ways. But if, if a NAFTA agreement didn't have things like supply management to protect our agriculture sector, if a, if a NAFTA didn't have protection for our auto sector, and if a NAFTA didn't um, deal with this issue of Chapter 11, we'd have to look at that. Okay. Um, I want to ask about the biggest fight in the country right now. Okay. Between the only two provincial NDP governments in the country. All right. In Alberta. And easy British question. Yeah. All easy questions here. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it seems to be easy for some of your staffers who are pl plainly on the, uh, on the um, British Columbia side, um, if I can judge from uh, Twitter. But um, uh, you got no John... No one gets their facts from Twitter. You got... <laughs> don't I know it. Um, <laughs> you got John Horgan, who's running a perfectly good NDP government out there and is trying to block Kinder Morgan. And you got Rachel Notley, who's running a perfectly good NDP government next door, who's trying to get Kinder Morgan through. Why does it seem to be such an easy choice for you? Which side you're on? Well, I, I think it's important to just nail that down. First of all, what Premier Notley is doing is exactly what she promised the people of Alberta. She promised that a dem new democratic government would fight for the interests of the people of Alberta. And she's fought to make sure that there was no cuts to education and health care at a time when the Conservatives were proposing massive cuts and slashing of those important sectors. Yeah. And she promised to fight for the economy in Alberta. She's doing her job. Premier Horgan is doing his job. He promised to protect the environment and to make that a central piece, and he's following through on his commitment. My fight isn't with either of these premiers who are phenomenal and we need them, both in power. My fight is with the Prime Minister, who promised to overhaul our environmental assessment process mm -hmm. to ensure that decisions were made in a way that were consistent in a modernized fashion that looked at energy projects holistically and looked at what were the criteria to approve an energy project? That's, that's where my concern is. He promised to deliver that and has not done so and has left people in a state of uncertainty with, with an assessment process that's not modernized, that's not up to date, that doesn't understand how to deal with energy projects in general. In the last federal election, there was an NDP candidate in Toronto, the, the well-known author, Linda McQuaig, who said, uh, I think we're going to have to leave some of that oil in the ground. Uh, the Mulcair campaign got her to backtrack, to the extent anyone can get Linda McQuaig to backtrack. Um, do you think she was right? Well, I think the spirit of what she's saying, if we take a look at it, if we look at our country, it's a resource extraction country. Let's be honest. Whether it's fossil fuels, whether it's mining, whether it's oil and gas, uh, our country is based on resource extraction, meaning that many, many, many jobs rely on these sectors. And so that's a reality. But where is the world headed? Where is the world headed in terms of reliance on certain substances? I think it's really clear if you look at recent agreements that countries have signed to have a, a full ban on fossil fuel-based or carbon-based vehicles in the future. We're seeing companies, car companies, committing to having all electrified vehicles. There's a certain direction that we're headed in, in society. 
And that direction is going to be towards sustainable energy and sustainable jobs. So if I'm looking from a position of leadership about the direction that we need to co plot for, the, for our country, the chart we need to, the, the course that we need to chart, then it has to involve an understanding of the future and a future that's not going to rely on, on these, these resources the same way. And also an environment that's, that's severely damaged because of the over-reliance on these, on these materials. And so for me, the future means we can't have economic justice without environmental justice and vice versa. So yeah. we can't actually tackle issues of the climate without making sure that people still have jobs. And that's going to be my commitment, that how can we transition people into jobs that are not jobs of the next five years, but are jobs of the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. And so people can rely on an economy that's going to work for them, and that's going to give them jobs that they can rely on for years and years to come. And I think that's going to, that's going to involve us moving towards uh, certain sectors that are more sustainable, that are more long-lasting, as opposed to relying on certain resources that are finite in their use and in their, in their relevance in the future. Um, but the funny thing about politics is that uh, while one is keeping one's eye on the seventh generation, one also has to make a decision this week. Is it the prime minister's job to get that oil to Tidewater? It's the, gov it's the prime minister's job to make sure we, we have good jobs for Canadians and that we protect our environment and that we're leaders nationally and internationally. And so there are certain projects that I've said, energy projects, that meet my criteria. And I think those are, those are projects that we can look at. And if they don't meet the criteria, there are projects that we should not go forward with. So my decision making around an energy project, whether it's a electricity developing or producing project or whether it's uh, a, a pipeline, the, the criteria are, are we investing in a project that's going to help us achieve our climate change goals? Are we creating local jobs and local opportunities? And are these opportunities something that's going to be long-lasting and it's going to be a, a sustainable option? These are some of the criteria we need to look at. How happy would Rachel Notley be to hear that checklist? Uh, I think, I mean, the work she's done, if you look at Premier Notley's work, she's got one of the most aggressive climate change plans in the country, the best plan. She's committed to reducing emissions. Uh, I, I fully believe if we want to achieve our goals as a nation in terms of reducing our emissions and tackling climate change, we can't do that without a premier like Premier Notley in government in Alberta. And so we have to respect that. Um, and uh, we, we've kind of done the tour here. We've done, we've done uh, trade, we've done balanced budget, we've done uh, energy. What are the other sort of cornerstones of the uh, suite of policies you're going to start rolling out next week? Well, healthcare is a big piece. And, and we touched on it, but I think it's important to, to really nail that down. There was a vision, there was a dream. Tommy Douglas had this vision of, of making sure that everyone had access to health care. And I think with any vision or any dream, you have to remain vigilant. And our health care, it's, it's a great system, but there are certain flaws in it. There are certain things that we need to improve. So we need to make sure the investments match our commitment. And we, if we're committed to universal health care, then the federal government has to commit to investing in that. And we've seen an, an erosion of that commitment in terms of investments. And the second piece is, we need to continue to look at how we can expand our healthcare to be a more wholesome product, uh, a more wholesome social network. And one of the big missing links is this pharmacare piece. Without pharmacare, you have a situation where people get ill, they can't afford the medication they need to get better, they get more and more ill, and they get in a position where they're you know, drastically unhealthy and they have to rely on emergency healthcare. And that's incredibly costly. That to me makes no sense. It's wrong in terms of the morality of it. It's just a wrong thing, but also doesn't seem to be a good use of our resources. If we actually invested up front in a, in a program that allowed people to have access to medication, they wouldn't get so ill in the first place, and we can manage that, that health, and it would actually reduce our costs. I think we need to really look at that as, as a forward-thinking vision of lifting people up, providing access to an important resource, medication, and, and also looking at it as completing the, that, that vision of a holistic healthcare system. Okay. We're heading into the spring of 2018 and the fall of 2019, there's going to be a federal election. I remember what this town was like uh, a little more than a year before the last election. Uh, the campaigning will already be underway. Uh, a year before that election, both the NDP campaign and the Liberal campaign put out social media pieces where they, they, they sketched the, 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 the map of, of victory for their party. Um, Stephen Harper never put out that piece of social media because in the end it turned out he didn't have a map. Um, but if you can, if, if you can, um, uh, sorry conservatives, but um, <laughs> if you can tell me where is 
an unprecedented NDP victory going to be found in 2019? Well, if I could turn the and question around. And we'll hold around. you to it. I'll come back to you yeah, yeah. the day after the next election. Sure, and say, yeah, you said this is going to happen. Yeah. Well, I, I want to turn around, and, and instead of focusing on I know, what our strategy is in terms of, of where we're going to campaign, uh, I want to focus on the stories we want to tell. And we want to tell the stories, and, and I want to share some of those stories, the stories of you know, a young person growing up, a ra young racialized person growing up in an urban city like Toronto, and the fact that they've faced carding or faced discriminatory police practices, and it's made them feel like they didn't belong. And I want to make sure that we do something at a federal level to ensure that that never happens again. And I want to tell the story of you know, a, a senior living in Atlantic provinces, you know, folks that I met with who talked about the fact that they couldn't afford their medication. Um, the story of you know, urban folks living in a city like Vancouver, young, young people that want to be able to live in this beautiful city, it's a beautiful city, but can't afford to because they can't afford to live. They can't afford to buy a place or rent a place. Uh, these are the stories I want to tell, the stories of folks that the stories that I've heard about people, young people, uh, folks that are racialized, facing discrimination, uh, women that continue to see uh, pay equity in 2018 has not been achieved. I mean, that to me is astounding that in a country like ours, a country that's, you know, I believe to be a country that should be a progressive country, that we still see the reality that women are getting sometimes 70%, 80% on the dollar of what men make. That should not be the case. We should have legislation in place that ensures that pay equity is a law that it should, be, it should not be an option, it should not be a question. And so these are some of the stories I want to tell in, in the next election. And these are stories that of, of people that I've spoken to. Somewhere in this room is the editor of McLean's, Allison Uncles. She's, she's going to be jumping up and down. I'm surprised I can't see her. Our next cover story is about pay equity. Oh, amazing. And so, it's like uh, I did a plug. I didn't like know you, that. you set us up. Yeah, <laughs> we appreciate that. No problem. Um, Anytime. <laughs> just invite me for another talk and we'll, we'll plug another cool issue. <laughs> um, careful what you wish for. Um, I want to, I've got some questions here from the internet and, and, oh, yes. and from Twitter. We're going to get to those, but one, one last question of my own. Sure. Um, I read somewhere that everyone who's ever elected U.S. president reaches a point where they sit in the Oval Office and they think, I do not deserve to be here. Mm. Uh, it is called uh, imposter guilt or imposter syndrome. <laughs> and there's a sense that, uh, sure, it was a lot of fun, but now the rubber's hitting the road and it doesn't feel, this job doesn't feel like something I can do. Mm. Um, I'm not going to ask you whether you experienced that, but do you ever have moments of doubt and how do you ground yourself in moments like that? I do, for sure, if you have moments of doubt. I think that's, that's real, that's human. People should feel that doubt. I think it's the way you work through it. You know, I think through it. I have a, a great group of people around me that help me through those moments. I think it's, it's okay to be honest about that. Like, you can't know everything and you can't be certain about everything. Uh, there's things that I'm absolutely certain about. There's certain values and principles that I have no question and that I, I will be unfailing on those. But there'll be times that I have felt doubt and I haven't been sure how to move ahead. And I think that's, that's a mark of good leadership, I think. It requires the ability to admit that, hey, sometimes I don't know, and it's okay. What's the biggest surprise since you became NDP leader? Oh, man. It's, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, immense, it's an immense task that I have in front of me, like changing the culture. Um, it is kind of like a big ship, and, and the inertia that you have to overcome to kind of turn it a certain direction. So it, it's been bigger than I thought to to try to implement the things that I want to see happen. It's happening, but it's, it's a lot of work. It's okay, I'm up for it though. If you had, uh, if you could pick the date of the next election, would you push it back? No, I'm up for the challenge. I like, I like working on a, under pressure and under a, a timeline, a deadline. I'm good with it. Okay. Thanks very much for your time. My pleasure. Uh, and now I'm going to reach into my magic bag of tricks. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and hope that Twitter gave us some good questions. All right, me too. Um, oh, hey, I like this one. Okay. Uh, from Alan Harris via Twitter. Uh, he says, Dear Mr. Singh, uh, with automation and AI defining the next industrial revolution, what does the NDP plan to do about the massive number of people for whom there will exist no jobs? Yeah, it's a real, real concern. Uh, I've been looking at AI and driverless car technology. It's probably the first, it's going to be the first wave of disruption. And, and lo a lot of folks that drive vehicles are going to see in the not too distant future that those jobs are going to be replaced by driverless automation that's going to be a real thing um, I think we need to be prepared for that and think ahead and think about how we can implement opportunities to train because there always will be needs to to provide input into if it's AI folks that help program the AI provide input into how it should be directed and how it should be modified so I think we need to be really forward-thinking and look that there are certain changes are going good that are going to happen and we need to start building in a transition towards you know how do we 
operate in a world without drivers of cars. We need to think about that. Um, the other piece is there's, there is a, a strong argument for you know, a basic income and how basic income could, could address some of these concerns. It's something I'm looking at as well. Okay. Um, another question from KM on Twitter. What will you do to achieve equal funding for the indigenous childcare crisis, especially in Manitoba, and on indigenous education and healthcare? There was an interprovincial conference here just a week ago about that. Um, the number of uh, indigenous children who are being taken into uh, childcare uh, from their families, is that something that you've devoted attention to? Well, with the in, in general, the indigenous file, um, justice for indigenous folks, this is, a, this is a massive issue of concern. If we want to say that we live in a just country, we cannot say that we live in a just country if the first people of this land, the indigenous people of this land, continue to face injustice. It's just not, it, it's untenable to have that position. We can't be in a just country and see the ongoing and continued injustice being faced by indigenous people. Uh, one of the first steps to, to rectify the issue when it comes to you know, funding is not taking indigenous people to court over funding they deserve. We've, we have a government that's contravened four compliance orders from the Human Rights Tribunal of Canada. I mean, I wouldn't do that. I would say, listen, there is a bona fide case here that Indigenous people should be receiving. First Nations kids should receive, should receive equal funding. We should commit to it. That's a starting point. And then we can we'll build on that. Okay. Um, the next question is from uh, John Callan via Twitter. Uh, and we're just going to tee you right up. Uh, <laughs> man, oh man, you're having a good night. Uh, many Canadians felt betrayed by Justin Trudeau and his promise in the 2015 election would be the last to use first past the post. Yes. Give us your thoughts on the merits and the problems of the proportional representation. What is NDP policy on this? Well, totally off the top of my head, because I did not think that this would be a question at all. And I didn't hope that someone would ask this question. Um, listen, for me, uh, it's not an academic question. When we talk about electoral reform, it's really about how do we give people power? How do people feel like their voice is being reflected? And the issue is people don't feel that. When they go to vote, people kind of question, like, is there any point in voting? Am I going to actually see any change? Am I going to see you know, a government that reflects my, my vote? And the answer often is no. They're not going to see that. That to me doesn't make sense. We've got false majorities that happen when you know, less than 40% of people vote for a party, but then it gets 100% of the power. That just doesn't sit well with people as a fairness piece. And it's not, it's not about the equation and the formula. It's about making sure people see in a concrete way their voice reflected in, in Ottawa. And so uh, the, the policy that I like is mixed member proportional which has an element of proportionality, but also the regionality of a regional list to ensure that people see a, a representative that comes from the region that understands the community in the area. Those are, those are some of the principles. So mixed member proportional, I, I wanna see proportionality in our government. I think that would encourage uh, a democracy that's more cohesive, where people work together, less of the kind of partisan fighting and more of the value proposition. I think that's an important change. How urgent is it? Is 2019 the last election to be fought under first past the post? If I win, yes. Okay. Take note of that. <laughs> uh. But, but and I'm, and I'm proposing proportional representation. That's what I want to see happen. Mixed okay. member, regional list. We'll work out the details together with Canadians, make sure we, we feel their input. But it's got to be a system where people, that value is so important. You have to feel like if I vote, my vote counts, it matters, and my voice is going to be heard in Ottawa. One assumes that there will still be a conservative, uh, a substantial conservative caucus, and uh, for all I know, they'll be the government. But if they're not, they'll be saying, you need to have a referendum on this, as they said with the Liberals. Would you have a referendum on electoral reform? Uh, I, that's what I've committed to before when I've, when I've looked at this. I think that we would, we would campaign on, on, this, on this idea, promote its virtues, and that it's something that you know, a lot of experts have weighed in on, saying that it helps democracy. Uh, I think over 80% of the people that testified at the committee hearings on, on this issue said that this is the way to go. Um, but I think there should, be an element, there should definitely be an element of, of people being able to confirm that this is a choice that they like. And the way to do that, there's been some proposals that implement the system and then have a referendum if, if people liked it or do the referendum up front. I'm not sure what the best way to do that is, but absolutely people should have a say in it. Okay, so you would consider sort of a test run and then get people to endorse or cancel the reform after the fact, after it's been, after it's been tried. Yeah, it's one of, the, it's one of the, the, the proposals that I've seen, and I can see that there's merit to that. There's also the idea of, of pitching the idea, having buy-in, and then implementing it. I don't know which one is the right way to go yet, but I know that we need to do something on it, and it's got to be proportional. Okay. Another question, which is the 
like almost the main question on Parliament Hill. This question came from someone in the room here tonight. How do you plan on making the Hill a safer place of work for women? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's the the big issue that our that our generation is faced with right now. That's a, a massive issue. I think that it is an incredibly inspirational moment where we're seeing women come forward, survivors are coming forward, and telling their stories in, a, in an unprecedented manner. And that's that's an incredible moment for us. It's a powerful moment for us. Uh, someone asked me, you know, issues around are we going too far? And I want to say that if we want to change the culture, we have to go far. Culture won't change unless we actually push it. And, and that's why I think it's so important that we take this opportunity to actually make that change happen. But I also think it's important that we're not looking at this, this moment right now about making workplaces safer for everybody, but for women particularly, who've for so long been the subject of a culture of silence, of just like brush on the rug, don't talk about it, don't, don't raise this issue. That's, that's heinous, that's, that's offensive, that's created the poisonous workplaces where women do not feel safe. We need to acknowledge that's the reality for far too many women. And in the halls of democracy, where we think this, this should be so hallowed and so protected, it's still maybe sometimes at its worst here, where there's so much silence. And so I think it's also an opportunity for us to not just point fingers and say, oh, it's this party or that group. It's not about that. It's actually about looking inwards and saying, how can we all grow and improve and build a better workplace? And I'm, I'm committed to that, and I'm going to take steps as much as I can to do that. There's obviously involved in this a debate over due process and over whether someone has the right to face their accuser and to know their accuser. And, um, uh, and due process itself is problematic because it often entails character assassination of women who are brave enough to come forward, so I understand mm -hmm. that. But some people worry that due process is being replaced by no process, that the wheels of change have rolled over one of your own MPs, Aaron Weir. Have you spoken to him? Does he know the nature of the accusations that he's facing? I have spoken to him, and I think this is, this is really tough. This, this is the, an example of where it's tough. And, but this work is important. It is so important that even if it's tough, it doesn't mean that we can't do anything about it. We have to act. I think there has to be an understanding, uh, a balance for sure. We need to address the fact that on one hand, we need to make sure that there's a, there's a culture that believes survivors, that is safe for people to come forward, that people who, who are survivors, people who have faced you know, harassment or violence, feel that they can actually tell their stories, but it has to be survivor-driven. It has to be a process that respects the, di the, the wishes and the desires of, of the person coming forward. But absent that, I think we can't afford not to act. We can't afford not to do anything. If there's any concern that's raised, uh, we have to do something about it. We have to act because it's important to ensure that people know we're committed to this, that it's not just words, that we're actually seeing action. And that's why, uh, in this case, there's gotta be a balance. There's gotta be fairness. The investigations have to be fair. We will actually undermine the work of, of changing the culture if we don't have a fair process. So the process has to be fair, but we can't ever forget that there is so much of a culture that we have to overcome that, that it's, going to be, it's going to be tough. It's hard, it's hard work, but we have to do it. Does this change has to be, have to be accomplished case by case, or can there be uh, uh, precinct-wide, Parliament Hill-wide uh, efforts uh, to change attitudes, to change men's behavior? Both, absolutely. There's got to be a case-by-case -case analysis, for sure. And there has to be an overall uh, shift in the culture uh, of, of Parliament Hill. Absolutely. Both have to happen. Okay. Um, I'm conscious of my time. Uh, I've got one more question, I think, from the floor. What do you think is the most effective way to relieve students of the enormous burden of student debt? I Another that question that I, you, I know you were dreading. Yeah, I'm totally dreading this one. Uh, I think we're, one, we have to acknowledge like it's massive pressure to feel that debt on your shoulders when you know you owe so much. It can, it can really be debilitating. Like You really lose motivation when you have this massive debt that's weighing on you. I think what makes debt even worse is when you know it's increasing, when there's an interest on it. That, that makes it scary. Debt's already scary, but the interest knowing that it's increasing makes it scary. I think the first practical step we can take is, is to waive the interest. On, on all student debt. I think that would be a, a bold, practical step that we, we should take. We should not be profiting off of the debt that students have. We should not be charging interest on that. And that would alleviate some of that stress. Uh, flexible payment programs, acknowledging you know, the, the realities of uncertain work and making sure that students graduating know that if they have work, then there would be payment that's flexible. But if there's no work, that there's uh, grace periods, some of these things would would be ways to address the, the, that pressure and that stress. How much of uh, 
impact can the federal government have on things like student debt? Uh, most of these things are run by the provinces. Uh, we often in Ottawa forget about the existence of federalism, but I'm pretty sure it's still there. <laughs> it's still there. Uh, how much how much purchase do you have over things like student debt? Well, there's there's a federal component. Most students have a federal component of their of their student loan. There's a provincial portion and a federal portion. So that federal portion is, you know, sometimes matches the provincial portion. In those cases, that's a pretty significant amount of money that we could, as the federal government, uh, ensure that students have relief on that on that debt. Okay. Um, and uh, one more question um, uh, that we got was about uh, the minimum wage sure. and the idea of fourteen dollar, fifteen dollar minimum wage. Um, suddenly everyone seems to be in favor of it, even the, the, the provincial uh, conservatives in Ontario. Um, uh, the uh, NDP ran on a uh, federal minimum wage last time. Absolutely. Would you maintain that policy? Would you tweak it? Uh, what would you do about the minimum wage? We've committed to it. As New Democrats, we've led the charge in, in the province of Ontario. Andrew Horvath committed to $15 minimum wage, then the, the government followed suit. Federally, we've led on this. This has been a file that we've been champions on. And I want to continue to lead on that. A, a livable wage is our goal, uh, but the first step is to raise minimum wage. And, and the 15 in fairness has been a campaign across Canada, even in the States, and it's an important starting point. But we also have to acknowledge it's a starting point. The next stage is to make sure that all wages are livable wages. Okay. Um, have you given any thought to a guaranteed annual income? I have. I, I've Apparently it would cost a mint. Yeah, it would. It would cost a lot of money. So uh, during the campaign, uh, one of now our, our, my parliamentary leader, Guy Cannon, really talked about uh, a universal kind of across the boards um, basic income guarantee. I like the idea a lot. I talked about basic income guarantees for certain communities, so for seniors, for Canadians living with disabilities, and for the working poor. Uh, I think we need to look at that as, as, a, as a justice piece, as a way of tackling inequality in a practical way, and a way that we can use the federal government's resources to actually help people's lives. How can you afford it? Uh, yeah, I mean, we talked about some of the solutions. One is making sure that we tackle the massive amount of wealth that's being siphoned out of our country, um, CEO stock options and, and um, tax havens. Um, there's been some reports that the, the amount of money that we're losing each year is in the multi, multi billions of dollars. And there hasn't been anyone that has had the courage to tackle this issue. And it's something that we as New Democrats believe we must and we can use that to fund some of the some of the important investments we need to make in social programs. Okay. We're heading into the home stretch here. Yeah. Ready. Um, I wanted to. Uh, I I have this. I'm flashing back. I have this weird acid flashback to the McLean's national leaders debate of 2015. Okay. Where nothing mattered the whole night long except that I end when the, when the two hours was up. You know. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> that's uh, all that matters. Exactly. Well, in the last five minutes, that's that's absolutely what matters. Um, two things happened at that convention in Edmonton, the last uh, the last NDP convention mm -hmm. a couple years ago. One is that the party cashiered Tom Mulcair, and the other is that the party, the delegates then present. Uh, uh, voted to have the party review something called the LEAP Manifesto in every riding of the country for the next two years. How has that review of the LEAP Manifesto gone? And what do you make of that? Because I have a hunch it's coming back at the, at the next convention in a week. Yeah, we'll see what happens at the convention. I think that, I don't know the details in terms of, of how each riding has dealt with it. Some ridings have had meetings, some ridings haven't, is, is what my understanding is, but I don't know the full workings of that. But I can tell you the general value it's very simple for New Democrats. If you ask a room full of New Democrats, you know, you ask a room full of people, human beings, do you care about the environment? Do you care about protecting the environment? Pretty sure everyone's hand would go up in this room if we asked the same question. I'm pretty confident everyone would say, yes, we should protect the environment. And then on the other hand, he said, hey, should we also have good work, stable work, sustainable work that could last for, you know, generations to come? People would put their hands up. So I think we're all on the same page. We need to protect the environment and we need, you know, sustainable work, work that's that's uh, future thinking that actually understands the direction that our society is headed in. Uh, how we come to that is going to be a big piece. What we can implement in terms of a, a program or, or transitioning programs that actually ensure that people have good work always, that workers are never left to the wayside. Like I said before, we can achieve the justice we, we need to see with tackling climate change and reducing our emissions if we leave workers uh, to, the, to the wayside. It won't work, it can't happen. We need to make sure that there's a solution that respects working people in Canada and also is committed to the environmental change, the environmental commitments that we know we, we have and values that we have as a society. And we know that we need to, given the massive ecological you know, 
devastation we've seen over the past year with forest fires and flooding and climate change impacting people's lives. Okay. We've seen stories to the effect that people associated with Jeremy Corbyn, people associated with Bernie Saunders, uh, are going to come uh, uh, at the invitation of people associated with the LEAP Manifesto and try and essentially disrupt uh, the NDP convention. It's got to be a pain to have these folks who, who appear every two years and, and want, to, want to announce the NDP what its, what its agenda is, and then you don't hear from them again until the next convention two years later. Or do these folks from around the world help to broad, broaden your tent? Well, I think that you know, discussion and, and debate is important. And then people are going to have different opinions. Uh, I think the values underlying them are all the same. We all believe, you know, progressives or New Democrats or people that care about one another, people that care about their neighbors, all want to build a world that's more that's fairer and then it's more just. I think that we can find that commonality, that that common thread, and build on that. I, I think sometimes folks focus on you know the minute differences, but really there's there's so much we have in common in terms of people that want to care for one another and take care of our neighbor, take care of this place we call home, our planet. I think we have far much more in common and, and we can build on that. Okay. Justin Trudeau has been Prime Minister for just a couple uh, years now. Uh, it is not often seen that a, a, a government elected with a majority uh, loses at the next election. It's hard to beat a first term majority government. Mm -hmm. What are the vulner vulnerabilities of this guy? I think when it comes down to it, uh, I, think, I think Justin Trudeau means well. And I think he, he, he talks about issues that matter. But I think there is, there is a bit of a dissonance where for him maybe it's a bit of an academic discussion when he talks about fairness or inequality. Maybe it's something that he's observing, he's, he's seen it. Uh, for me, it's a personal matter. I've, I've experienced a little glimpse of what it's like to be discriminated because of the way one looks. I've experienced a little glimpse of what it feels like to face some of the economic struggles that Canadians face and some face far, far worse and continue to face. But I've glimpsed a little bit of what that's like to have the pressure of supporting a family fall on one's shoulders when my father fell ill in, in my 20s. And having experienced some of that inequality and that unfairness and some of those struggles, when I talk about building a, a more just society, a fair Canada where we have access to pharmacare, we have access to tuition, where we make sure that housing is affordable, I'm coming from a place where it's a personal lived experience. And I think that's, that's maybe the difference. Okay. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. We'll see how it all works out for you and for everyone else in the, uh, in the political uh, combat. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, come and spend a whole hour with us in That's this awesome. beautiful room in front of this crowd. I want to thank everyone in the audience for coming out and taking part in this conversation. And I uh, absolutely want to thank our sponsors, the Canadian Bankers Association, for making this possible. We'll be back here in a little bit more than a month with uh, Andrew Shear, your colleague, the leader of the uh, Conservative Party, and uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Drive safely. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That's good, man. Enjoy that.